Patrick, can you tell us about your background? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Have we got enough time? I don't know. It's my background, what can I say? I suppose what you'd say is I'm a bit of a Billy Elliot character, really, because I started my life in heavy engineering. And then, uh, you know, for whatever reason, we went into this, you know, you had to go and get a trade back in the day. I come from a very sort of working class background, so socioeconomic background dictated you went and got a trade. It was classed in them days, which is totally wrong and totally bigotry. Um, it was classed as um, effete to go and be an artist. For men to go and do arts was seen as a bit effete, really. And uh, the background I come from, it was a case of go and get this trade. So I ended up in heavy engineering, ended up as a, a Dean Smith & Grace centre lathe turner. High precision work, um, working to half a thou of an inch on bearing cases, big castings, um, heavy, heavy work, very heavy work, actually. Um, and then, uh, cut a long story short, came out of that for good reasons, really. Um, and I've done a succession of jobs. I've been post off, been a postman. I've done all sorts, really, to be honest. Window fabricator, I've done all sorts. But the, the abiding thing is I got made redundant, and it was a case of I saw this thing about... I was going to go into computers, and then just suddenly I saw these courses, and it was a case of go back and train and I just it was like switching a light bulb like road to Damascus really because it was like yeah this is what I should be doing this is the only thing I was any good at at school and the art teacher actually came to the house when, when you know I had a place allotted ready for art school so it's what I should have done originally so you can imagine in my late 20s it was just it was like it really was a drive I had to do it and it changed my life to be honest completely changed my life um, in life, we all go through different things and, and you go through different machinations. And I virtually reinvented myself, but I found out to be the person I really am inside. Uh, and that's it's, it's really led to a lot of things. I've never looked back. Um, did my degree. I won a scholarship in Erasmus over to Holland in Utrecht. Studied painting and printmaking, became a specialist printmaker. So I learnt lithography. I learnt all sorts of things, really. Came back and... Um, I, I won't say I fell into lecturing. I think that would be doing lecturing a disservice. I think it was a case of I was started off very traditional route, technician in at the local college where I actually did my foundation course. And then as soon as they sort of recognise, and it happens like a drip feed, when they recognise you're a good pair of hands and you can cover for people, I started doing the evening class with you covering for different people. And I just got the bug. I loved it and got good report, good feedback back. And I just thought, yeah, I've got to pursue this. So then I went and did a post-grad uh, full teaching qualification and I've never looked back since. I've been very busy lecturing. Um, and then that was very, you know, I ended up working at three colleges. So probably burnt out because I was working at Harrogate College. I was working at St. John's on the degree program. I was an examiner for a brief time. Did all sorts of work there and then and visiting lecturing predominantly. And then I was an associate lecturer at York College and ended up at a programme on the part-time foundation course. So I'm very proud of what I achieved academically. Very proud indeed. And then that all changed. It, it come crashing down a little bit, shall we say. Um, I was diagnosed with a, a quite a serious lung disease. But you know what? In life, you, these things hit you and you go forward and you look for other ways. And uh, to be honest, and it sounds absolutely ridiculous to say this, but there's a silver lining, and the silver lining is that I'm back on with my work, full-time painting, full-time printmaking. Um, I teach privately now. I teach what I choose to teach. Um, I control the teaching, um, given my tiredness and, uh, and the effects of my illness. But you know what? I, I manage them like everybody else. My glass is always half full, and I'm going forward. And I'm really chuffed about that, you know, really pleased, very proud, in fact, to do what I'm doing. Uh, consequently, I've uh, built up a, a burgeoning career uh, showing to great acclaim in London. I've done all the major art fairs, uh, culminating in showing with Highgate Contemporary at the Royal College of Art International Art Fair in 2014, which I'm exceptionally proud of. I was on the wall with some of my heroes in the secondary market, so you've got Peter Lanyon, Roger Hilton, Terry Frost, all big names. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, I also, with a very dear friend of mine who, who lives and works in York, uh, Jake Attry, who's based out at Dean Clough Galleries, I got a show uh, there in 2012. Uh, I submitted a CD with my images, and uh, next minute I've got a one-man show at Dean Clough. So that, in terms of like bullet points in your career, 
you know, showing and exhibiting your work, you can't get much higher than that, really. You know, it, it's... Uh, but what I've done is I've, de I've made a very conscious decision now to not so much relocate, because I've always been York. I'm a York man. Uh, but I'm, I'm relocating visually in terms of concentrating on the regional galleries and concentrating on the north of England. Um, it's my spiritual home anyway. Um, we live now in a beautiful village at the foot of the Awadian Hills. So it's, it's just heaven sent. I've been able to set up a home studio gallery, which we're sat in today. Um, and so I can market my work with the help of my lovely wife, Nicola. We, we work together and we've done very successfully North Yorkshire Open Studios last year. Um, we've done our own private open studios this year with Justine Warner, a textile artist friend of mine, who was just a few doors down. So we've got, we're in a bit of an artistic enclave here, and uh, that's certainly paying dividends, you know. So I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. Probably now is probably the most contented I've ever been uh, with my work. It's selling. I've got local representation with the galleries. I'm extending that, and obviously we've got private view gallery facility here as well. You mentioned Jay Cantry, and this is a question I asked him. Yeah. Do you think of yourself as a northern artist? Yes, very much so. Um, now, I say that with a, a, an immense amount of pride, actually. Um, when I say artist, I mean artist internationally and, and nationally as well. But you can't... There is always an antecedence. There's always something that, that is... Uh, call it DNA, call it in the water, call it what you want. Uh, there is something that galvanises who you are, where you come from... And, and what your interests are. Um, I wouldn't say I was an urban artist. Um, I wouldn't say um, I, w I wouldn't say I was an architectural artist. I think Jake's work is more urban and looking towards architecture. I'm I'm more towards in the painting, definitely more towards the sublime in landscape. But the thing with me is I have a duality because as well as the sublime that and one can think of Claude Lorraine, one can think of Constable, and of course let's not forget our hero Turner. That's great, and I'm, I'm not trying to be any of those. I'm just influenced by these people, and contemporary-wise, I look at people like Fred Cummings, uh, you know, Ken Howard, um, the Royal Academians, I look at these people, but they're inspirational. But the duality with what I'm doing is that, as well as that, I already have a, a very strong leaning towards modernism and the St Ives movement. So there's a crisp duality in what I'm doing. I can be very, very abstract. I can be very uh, figurative. To the layman, they would look at my work and say, oh, well, that's an obvious landscape and I can access that visually. Uh, or that's obviously abstract. But to the more informed, I don't see any difference because to me, painting and printmaking, certainly as a visual language, it's all abstract. The whole thing's abstract. It's an abstraction to try and put down something of the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface. That's abstract in itself. Uh, photography's abstract. You know, it's an abstract concept. It's a lie. It's a mechanical lie. It's a very persuasive lie, but it's it's an abstraction. So, so in that way, um, I tend to work um, with my heart. I don't paint for the galleries. I don't paint for any dealers. I don't paint for any collectors. I paint for me. I paint for myself. And then it's very rewarding if somebody else catches on to what you're doing and understands that. It's a wonderful thing. So what sort of influence has your engineering background? A fantastic question. I think <laughs> it's a funny one, this, because in order to get where I've needed to get to, in other words, um, all the tropes of, uh, of freedom, of uh, fine art and conceptualism, which is I did a very fine art degree course at Leeds Metropolitan University. And with that, I had to jettison a lot of what you would call sacred cows, um, now, when I came into art, as I say, as a mature student in my late 20s, um, the trope was, you know, learning to draw, learning to paint, learning how to move paint around, learning all the rudiments, shall we say. And I'm very, very lucky in that way because I was taught by uh, a Royal Academy called David Platts. So I was extremely lucky to have, have this chap working with me. I'm very lucky. To have, in fact, I owe David an immense amount. And uh, I was only with him for a year, and then I went on to do my foundation and I went on to do my degree. If I look back, I spent a long time negating jettison in my engineering past because that was a very geometric, a very tight, a very rigid environment. And it was very much to do with detail, very much to do with accuracy. Um, and in a way, that's the um, 
uh, can be the, uh, an anathema to fine art practice in terms of loosening up, freeing up, both spiritually and physically, you know, mentally and physically as well. Um, so in that way, I negated it. Now, the irony is, and this is the irony, when I was doing my foundation course, I discovered printmaking. And for some strange reason, which I now understand, I took to it like a duck to water. I, I did just machinery, process. I thought I understood it. I got it very, very quickly, uh, very physical, um, and I enjoyed it. And I thought, yeah, why, why is this? And I realised it's definitely a link to the engineering. Machinery doesn't scare me. Uh, technique and process doesn't scare me. And I'm in there and get blathered up and, and get going. And it, it, it's sort of a... It, there's a real duality with engineering with the thing because it's almost... If you think about etching, for instance, it's almost like sculpture because it's a raised emboss. It's a relief uh, emboss, really. So it's... The sculptural connotations, many printmakers make sculptures and paint and all sorts of things across the divide. So in that way, I saw a lot of links, but I had to somehow jettison the rigidity of my engineering past. It's now come full circle. I'm very, very lucky. I, I, I can frame all my own work. I've got those handcraft skills as well on top of on top of the normal stuff that I can do with my painting. So yeah, it definitely does link back now. Didn't used to, but it does now. We've seen you in the studio, yeah. and it's a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> but Great. The precision engineering thing, just, just describe what you had to do as a precision engineer. Oh, okay. Um, well, obviously I worked for a very local company, now de sadly defunct, but very old, almost Dickensian really, Adams Hydraulics. And it was generally the parlance in York anyway, if you had an apprenticeship either at the railway, round trees, or, or Adams Hydraulics, you've got a, a thorough grounding, a proper traditional, one of the last, really, traditional uh, uh, apprenticeships. Now, that links to the fact that they had their own iron foundry. So they used to produce their own castings, uh, cast, predominantly cast iron, and we used to work machine, big amphistoma bearing cases. So these were for the marine industry. I believe at one point, way before my time, they did some refit for the pumps on the QE2 and stuff like that. So big stuff, big industrial stuff, mainly for the water authorities. And these amphistoma bearing cases had to be precision machined. So when I say a bearing case, you've got a bearing and a shaft and an impeller, and that forms the, 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 the pump, basically, that's going to pump uh, uh, fluid, water, in a massive capacity. Now, for it to, to spin at high resolution, it has to run on bearings and it has to be balanced so it doesn't cavitate. So when you're machining for the bearings, the Skefco bearings that go in, they have to drop in under their own weight with oil. So they have to be absolutely parallel, uh, square if you like, uh, to the bore. So you, do a, you bore it to a, a half a thou. You can have a, a plug gauges to get you there. It's all micrometer work, it's all measuring, it's all high precision. You finish off with a bit of wet and dry while it's spinning. And then finally, you can place the bearing. And the idea is the bearing should just go in under its own weight. And that's precision engineering. No, there can be no room for error. When you say half a thou, that's... That's, yeah. Half a thou. Half a thou is half a thousandth of an inch, 32 seconds. The 32 seconds of an inch. So 32... Uh, down to sixteenth, down to half a thou. Half a thou is t is tiny. I mean, what it is metric. I used to be able. To, I used to know what it was metrically. I don't know it because uh, we used to. I was brought up with uh, the the metric system, and when I went there, it was so old fashioned. We were working imperial, so all the drawings were in imperial. So we had to learn both. Now, because I went to tech college uh, in in the first incarnation as an engineer. And that's the irony. I ended up at the same place where I, later on that I did my engineering at, which is bizarre, really. Um, but yeah, it's um, it was very close tolerance work. You, there's like you have like things called interference fits. So, for instance, if I'm doing a hand wheel, I'm machining a big, big swan hand wheel, big Victorian things with it. The the patterns haven't changed from from the 1890s. You know, I mean, you're machining these things, beautiful, elegant looking things. And you'd machine it for to take um, um, uh, a gunmetal bush, and you'd do a, an interference fit on that of two thou. So the idea there is 
the, the actual bore is tighter by two thousandths of an inch than the actual brass bush that you're going to put in that's got a hackney thread on it. So what you do is you put a lead in on that one, you put oil on it and you take it to a fly press. And these big fly presses have great big weights on. And if you get it wrong, you'll crack the casting. So in other words, if you're trying to put the bush in not square, you'll crack it. Um, it has to be led in square, square onto the, to the bore with the oil and then you just gently squash it in. And that's called an interference fit. Um, some people do, some engineers, when they're doing bearing cases, they do heat bonding where they put the heat, the casting up, put the thing in and then let it cool. And that's another way of, of uh, doing fits. We're talking about pre-computer here, aren't we? Oh, God, yeah. It was a, everything I did was what we call hand vernier. It was a real skill. It was four years' apprenticeship uh, to get where I was. And um, to be fair, uh, some of the old boys, they did seven years. So I was like a doctor, you know. It's uh, quite amazing, really. I mean, I look back, it's a part of my life that it'll never leave me. It's in me. It's, it's in my vernacular. It's in my day. It's who I am. Uh, but it isn't, if you know what I mean. It isn't who I am, you know. There's the inside of this chap who was working his Dean Smith and Grace centre lathe at Adams Hydraulics in a busy machine shop, big into everything I did was block and tackle, lifting into the lathe. You couldn't lift anything; it was all it all had to be cradled in. So it was all big stuff. But there I am doing that. But inside, I want to be outside painting. I want to be. I want to be an artist. So that's when I say about the Billy Elliot thing. It's a real. A real um, sort of duality again, a, 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 a real difference in what I'm doing now. Completely different. But as I say, you cannot go through that and not have all the skills I've got, uh, which I translate across now in later life. Do you ever feel nostalgic about that time? No. No, that, that is interesting. No. It's, um, it's left me with a, a quite a serious illness that I'm battling called pulmonary sarcoidosis, um, which I've been battling for 16 years. Um, and it's one of those awful dilemmas where there's no uh, litigation or compensation because it's not a notifiable disease like asbestosis. There's no profima case or whatever, you know, it's, uh, that doesn't exist at the moment. Ironically, in America, it's different. All the first responders to the Twin Tower disaster are all getting sarcoid-related illnesses and getting uh, compensation. So it's, that's a separate issue. And, you know, as I say, it's just something I have to live with. But it does impact on my life. So, no, my memories of, of working at Adam's Adderall, so I have a, the nostalgia I have for the camaraderie, yes, um, the chaps I've worked with, the people that um, uh, helped me with my trade, um, second to none. But uh, in terms of the actual setup, the health and safety, and what it's actually left me with in terms of uh, my illness is, uh, I'm afraid I don't. I, uh, no, I don't look back fondly on that. <laughs> I'm glad I'm doing what I'm doing now. Right, you're not just a printmaker, are you? No, uh, it's a, it's once again, brilliant question. Uh, the painting, the printmaking, I was known for a long while as a printmaker, solely as a printmaker, but there's always been the painter in me. And what's happened now and this sounds, I know this will sound very strange, but because of my painting taking off in a big way, it's, it's given me a reason to make prints. I know this sounds bizarre. In printmaking, you go down certain routes and, and you're, you're taking images, you're manipulating images, and, and then you, 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 you're sort of either taking them into woodcut, lino cut, into collar graphs, into etching, whatever. And that has its very own particular language, shall we say, and certain stylizations that take place, especially with woodcuts and things like that, immediately graphic, immediately powerful, especially the black and white monochromatic work. But in a way, it's of its own making and its own history. Uh, and painting is, 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 I won't say it's better and I won't say it's bigger, it's different. But I was reaching an impasse and I started painting to try and get through the impasse, thinking that this would feed the printmaking. But what's actually happened is the printmaking's fed the painting, which then has internally gone full circle again. So it's bizarre now. So if I say to you, I now have a reason to make prints because I'm painting full time. And the paintings, they're predominantly landscape driven. But when I had the one man show at uh, Dean Clough Galleries, they were all abstract. 
And this is that duality again. So I bring all the various languages that, that I'm familiar with, that I'm interested in, and I bring it into my painting. And I've got, I paint like a printmaker, I printmake like a painter. And this is quite crucial. These techniques I use in painting, which are very familiar to, to painters, like tonking. If you think of Henry Tonks, I think he was head of the Royal Academy or whatever, and he, he used to put newspaper on, on, on canvas and then take the paper off. And it was to take out the oil in the paint and to kick it back. Um, that's a, one of my favourite techniques. And it's not, akin, it's, it's not unusual with printmaking either. You know, you've seen me taking layers and taking off and getting textures. So it's exactly the same in paint. So I do paint like a printmaker. I'm not a pure painter. And with that in mind, I paint with my hands. I don't use brushes. Um, so all the paintings in here, all the paintings behind me, uh, and, and there's monoprints as well, but the main paintings, they're all done with my fingers. They're all done with my hands, which isn't unusual. Turner used his hands, of course. But even something as big as that? Yeah, five foot before four foot, that. Yeah, it's a monster. Uh, yeah, I mean, even something as big as that. I'd use a big brush to block in, but then everything you're looking at, any perceived detail that there is done with my fingers and a palette knife. So all that foam and spray? It's all done with a palette knife. It's done with a palette knife and my fingers. The sky is particularly painted with my hands. So it's a sensory thing, very much a sensory thing. Uh, it's a feeling thing. Uh, once again, conceptually, I will, I'll say to you now, I'm not a marine painter. I'm not interested in waves and seas. I'm not interested in landscapes. And yet I'm painting these landscapes and seascapes because I'm using them as an armature to move paint around. So there's a bigger concept going on there. It's not, it's not me being pretentious or clever or anything like that. It's just I'm using it as a vehicle to make work. But that sea is a, a landscape of the mind. That sea is based on, it can be based on, the, on, on Sands End, Robin Hood's Bay, the East Coast, but it can be a deep ocean swell. Yeah, wouldn't want to be out in that. You wouldn't want to be out in that. It's barreling, it's coming over. And that knowledge base of how that is structured comes about because I paint plan A. I go out, I've, I, I, there's an image of me stood at Sands End on the marine wall painting, and a wave crashed over. My easel went, all my stuff, I got soaking wet, and there's a couple of beach casting couple in there painting from Hull. They were lovely, they were doing the fishing. And we shared a flask of coffee, you know, we both dried off and we carried on again, you know. They thought it was completely bonkers, you know. But that's what I'm like. I go out, I paint what I see, I bring it back to the studio, and that gets a muscle memory. It's like a muscle memory. And that gets synthesised then after copious amounts of photographs and images, found images. But nothing is copied from a direct image. I'm not interested in copying photographs either. It's just that acts as totems. So in that boiling sea, yeah. there's one straight line. <laughs> well, there is, and there's, there's, in fact, on the other side, there's a little bit of scraffito as well, uh, pulling back. Well, what I'm trying to do is I'm denying you that image. I'm saying to you, yeah, that's a very formidable ocean, deep ocean with a swell and everything going on. And then if you notice, none of my paintings are signed. There's no, there's no typography or signature on the actual canvas. And the reason for that is I'm not actually that vain. And I'm not interested in, 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 in my typography interfering with the image. So what I do is that all my paintings, and once again, I'm not unusual. There's plenty of other people do it. All my paintings are signed on the verso. Consequently, that line you could say is authorship. You could say it's my mark. What it does, and it's not a gimmick, I don't do it on all the work, but I do it on quite a few. What it does, it sets up deep space. Now, I didn't know this when I did it. I just made the mark, which is quite brave to do, through to the canvas. And I've done it and reinforced it as the painting developed. And I've done it to sort of show you that it's, a, it's an illusion. I broke the illusion. But what happens conversely, although it cuts through the paint to the canvas, it's floating and it sets up deep space. Also, it's no mistake that I've put it almost three quarter composition on the canvas. And that plays back to um, sort of academic painting from the Renaissance. One thinks of the golden mean, you know, if you look at uh, Piero della Francesca's work, there's a lot of geometry in his painting. So there's a few little cues going, visual cues going on there, if you, if you wanted to find it. 
So you, do you, have you moved completely away from abstract? No. It was funny enough, I was having a conversation with another artist friend of mine uh, at my opening in town at a gallery show I've got. And I, I was saying about this, um, no, I, 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 I have a series of paintings that, that I did called Falling Forms. And they're very, very um, based on... Well, I look a lot at constructivist work, Kazimir Malevich, Sergei Polakoff, people like that. But then if you look in the 1950s uh, and, you, and you look at people like Terry Frost, um, William Scott in particular, people like that, this idea of taking very simple motif systems and then building up images that were all about the edge. And, and as I said with the monoprinting, there's an arena. It's an arena to operate in. And if you can break the edge then you're starting to have something about paint becoming self-referential, paint talking about itself. One of the advantages of abstraction, and it's also a disadvantage of abstraction, the advantage is, is that you can talk about the stuff of paint, you can get quite esoteric about it, but the disadvantage, the disadvantage, is it can disappear under its own, you know, it can get too clever and too uh, obscure, shall we say, and where there's nothing to hang your coat on visually at all. And Francis Bacon, I mean, he was a great, um, you know, raconteur, and one of the things he, he said, in the end, abstraction can end up just being pattern. I'm not as cynical as Francis Bacon, but I do know what he means by that. I do understand that. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny language. It, but, you see, it's all abstract. This is an abstract painting for me. It's just is more accessible visually, but it's to me it's abstract. To understand how to paint things, you have to be abstract. To understand how to draw, you have to understand about edges. So that line, we think we see lines in nature, but we don't. We see edges. And the first tenets of learning to draw is how to devise an edge. So if you think of Matisse with his beautiful weight of mark. That's, that's, that's the first tenets of drawing. So once you learn to draw and you use the line, which becomes like an elastic band, but if you learn about weight of mark and it can go disappear to nothing, then you're describing an edge and the brain starts to finish it off. And that's one of the absolute joys of art, I think, where unlike photography, which gives us far too much of a convincing, uh, all the information in one go, paintings can go further they're not better than photographs, but they can go further in the sense that the brain finishes off. It's left to you, the viewer, um, co-opted into the visual process. And you leave, the best paint is for me, leave it out. So if you look at Walter Richard Sickert and people like that, they, you know, they're some of my heroes, these people. You, you will see, Hugh Nuglo, another great painter. You, they, it's what they leave out that's important. And that's why painting's so physical, organic, and it's the stuff of pen. So, despite the fact that you're getting messy with your hands, and yeah, and yeah, sort of yeah, there's this huge iceberg of theory underneath all this. Very much so. Oh, yeah. Um, I probably am a product, to be fair, of a very conceptual fine art degree course. Um, Leeds was synonymous with uh, practitioners that push the boundaries. Now, also, you've got to think when I went to college, Later on, um, we had the Brit Art Pack um, were beating the drum. So we had your Damien Hirst, your Tracy Emmons, your Rachel White Reeds. We, they're now part of the establishment, you know, but at the time they were the YBAs. Uh, all that feeds in as well. But because I was that bit older, um, and there is a romanticism as well, I, I am linked to craft, I am linked to skill. I do think you should be able to draw. I do think you should be able to, should be able to uh, uh, move paint and manipulate material. Um, there's a, a wealth of uh, learnt understanding with mixing printing inks, for instance. In printing inks, you do you mix your colours, you tint colours with printing inks because they're so highly pigmented. Painting's a different ball game completely. And once you learn, that's what that's what really gives me maybe an edge with my painting as well because I know how to mix colours, I know how colours work, um, and because I've got that sensitivity through the printing inks, you bring that into painting, it it it, it doesn't have to make a difference. But yeah, there is a lot of, it's there if you want it. My collectors, my viewers, the people that follow my work don't have to access all that. Um, I would hope they just buy it, hopefully, or they buy into it because they find it visually appealing. 
And there's nothing more or less to say than that, really. It, it doesn't have to have this loading, but there is the loading in its conception, certainly, definitely. I, I, I'm a great believer and I'm passionate about contextual awareness and art history, passionate about that. And I follow that through in my teaching as well. Mm -hmm.